What I'm going to talk about this morning is uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe and how we grow what we all aspire to, which are resilient, inclusive communities. Um, the Greater Golden Horseshoe is the most densely populated region in Canada. It has over a fifth of the population of the entire country. It is the fastest growing city region in North America. Uh, and the population is expend, expected to grow to 13.5 million by 2041. It, the land area is enormous, approximately 33,500 square kilometers, of which 22% is covered by the green belts. And what I'm going to talk about is the fact that climate change is obviously an imperative and where we grow, and COVID-19 may be an accelerator. So if you look at the region that we have inherited, um, its form has been largely shaped by a mid 20th, century, mid 20th century embrace of the car. A key moment in mid 20th century was the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. Um, this extraordinary exhibit that you see on the left that millions of people pass through on a moving sidewalk uh, was the General Motors uh, Pavilion, Your World of Tomorrow. But what General Motors was selling was not just cars, but they were selling a way of life based on the car. That was quickly picked up in our region. So just four years later, on the right, uh, Toronto's plan was basically uh, a version of what that diorama was depicting. You can see the yellow areas. You can see the beginning of a set of highways. Uh, if you look on the left, you start to see a clover leaf appearing. Uh, and essentially, it was moving to a model of a central business district in downtown Toronto and a series of bedroom dormitory suburbs uh, dependent on automobile transportation surrounding it. And by 1966, the Metropolitan Toronto Plan, uh, which if you look carefully, um, you can see that a large part of what is today the city of Toronto was still farmland, uh, was expanding that very same model of what today we refer to as the Yellow Belt out into the hinterland in all directions. So this 400 series of highways quickly became um, the enabler of a vast expansion uh, based on uh, land use separations, activities that were accessed primarily um, by car. And you can see in the, in the aerial photograph, this could be almost anywhere in the region, this typical pattern of auto-oriented cul-de-sacs, uh, strip malls, power centers, uh, people pretty much forced to driving to everything that they would need in their daily lives. So the problem is that this pattern, um, this pattern tested to failure almost in, as quickly as it was established. So you see a Life magazine cover from 1960 uh, basically making the point that as quickly as the interstate highways were built in the U.S., uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, had been impressed by seeing the autobahns of Germany, came home and built 46,000 miles of interstate highways, and they started to look like what you see on the left. Uh, we began polluting the atmosphere and inducing climate change, and one thing we were not aware of was the extent to which we were compromising our health, uh, creating uh, large amounts, even in children, of obesity, heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes related to a sedentary way of life. And we absolutely cemented our dependence on fossil fuels. So unfortunately, that world of tomorrow, that, that very um, extraordinary pavilion in the 1939 World's Fair, uh, didn't produce a reality that was what was promised. And in fact, daily experience behind the wheel began to take a really heavy toll on people's lives. Uh, what you see on the left is a screenshot from a movie I would really recommend. It's called Radiant City. It's about living in suburban Calgary. 
Um, I have a small part in that film, but the if you look at the rear view mirror, you see uh, one of the people in this, uh, and I, I won't spoil it for you, it, it's a mockumentary that among other things is really entertaining, but this, this gentleman is contemplating his life and the hours he spends sitting in his car and civic action uh, in the Toronto region uh, created this world word cloud based on a survey uh, showing the things that people thought they were sacrificing by being trapped in traffic. The Board of Trade issued a dire warning about the negative impact of congestion, uh, the drag on the economy uh, that years ago when they first came out with this in 2001 was already a $6 billion drag on the economy. And if you look at the expansion of the blue area, the congestion, had we continued down that path, uh, they were saying that by 2031, uh, this would be um, a complete disaster uh, in terms of uh, the impact on our financial viability. But what it did perhaps even more significantly is it changed the environment that we share in our daily lives. And if you go clockwise from the upper left, you can see a portion of the pre-war city of Toronto, which adapts itself beautifully to 21st century life with walkable sidewalks, active street uses. And then as you moved out through the rings of time to moving to the right and then down below, you see the environment basically scoured, buildings pushed back to create uh, parking lots, uh, the crossings ending up wider and wider. And eventually you get to a point where human beings are not supposed to be on foot in these environments. Medical officers of health have noted that connection between public health and this way of life and negative incomes in terms of both chronic and infectious disease. So this was something prepared by the Toronto's Medical Officer of Health showing a correlation between low walkability evidenced by the darker colors and higher increase of both chronic and infectious disease. And lo and behold, the pre-war city, the part of the city that was built before the automobile, before that 1939 World's Fair image, before the Toronto Plan of 1943, has much greater walkability, has main streets, streetcars, uh, then more enhanced transit eventually with uh, subway, but it is much more walkable. And as you get into the post-war suburbs, that decreases drastically. So before COVID, we were already in the throes of overlapping paradigms the mid 20th century post-war paradigm, the embrace of the automobile and a new paradigm that was revealing itself. And essentially the auto-centric vision was being challenged. And this challenge was coming from a variety of places, uh, big forces, economic, demographic, environmental, and the North American dream. And that image you see of the, the car, the driveway, um, the house, which is a very nice version of that way of life, actually came from a site called the American Dream, um, was being um, set aside by a large number, particularly of young people, as a competing dream emerged for them reflecting different priorities. And they were voting with their feet in significant numbers, choosing to live in places where they could walk to buy groceries ride a bike to school for their kids or have immediate access to a local park or transit. So these two things were happening simultaneously. In 2013, the Urban Land Institute, the ULI, which is probably the most prestigious uh, organization of developers based in North America, but actually worldwide, issued a report to their members and basically uh, was telling people who are building space to lease or rent to uh, or sell to uh, their clients that they should be aware of the fact that there were significant community preferences for compact walkable development and that this would have uh, a tremendous influence in shaping urban growth patterns. So that this was a, a very, very influential 
document for people in the development industry. So this big shift is represented by these two images. On the left, you see uh, the auto-oriented image, the inherited mid 20th century image, you know, lots of cars on a major artery or a highway, land uses separated into places where you would have to travel from one to the other uh, with large amounts of space devoted to parking and your daily life was really a series of trips from one to the other. And on the right, this new image where you see the appearance of bike lanes, uh, lanes of public transit, and you see the emergence of mixed use and walkability as an ideal. Um, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, um, produced this really interesting and extremely influential diagram. She actually ran a successful mayoral campaign based on this. She called it Paris d'un quart d'heure, Paris of 15 minutes. Um, and this whole idea that from where you lived, chez moi, my house, you would have access, uh, easy access by walking and cycling to every aspect of your daily life. And this became uh, an extremely uh, compelling aspiration. It started to be reflected in international best practices everywhere. So on the lower left, you see the province of Ontario's version of this for what it calls TOCs, transit oriented communities. Um, the fact that at these transit locations, you would have daycare, medical services, uh, transit, uh, community attributes, affordable housing, recreation, et cetera, et cetera, all the same things as in the Paris diagram, uh, upper right, Melbourne's version of the same thing, and upper left, the, basically the idea that rather than everything being spatially separated, from a health standpoint, a convenience standpoint, the pleasure in your life, but also very significantly in terms of environmental goals, and reducing CO2 emissions, the goal is to make places where people could do pretty much everything everywhere in close proximity. So my entire career as a professional really has been guided by this, this second emerging paradigm. I wrote two books about it, Walking Home, which came out in 2011, Toronto Reborn in 2018. And my first assignment uh, when I began to set up the urban design group, what became the Division of Architecture and Urban Design in Toronto was the St. Lawrence Historic District, which the city had, through its reform council, had committed to turning into a place where people could actually live. And probably 90% of what you see in that photograph on the left, when I started working in that area, was a surface parking lot. And now there is an area surface parking lot to be seen. So that's in the heart of a pre-war city. I have then gone on to work on a whole series of post-war cities, auto-oriented cities. And what you see in the right is Bank Street in Ottawa, actually very close at the bottom of the image to where the occupation is going on as we speak. Um, and was brought in by the city of Ottawa to look at how this trans this artery with its power centers and strip malls surrounding neighborhoods, the, the very pattern that I showed you earlier, could be transformed into a transit rich walkable set of neighborhoods. And that's going on throughout post-war areas uh, in many city regions. So that was all happening already. Then in March, 2020, and we're coming up very close to two years uh, to when this happened, the world changed dramatically. And it turns out that COVID has been a particle accelerator and it is pushing us to do many of the things we were already doing or want to do anyway, faster and more nimbly. And this is actually the good side. So all of the major changes that we were already facing around mobility, aging infrastructure, clearly uh, climate change, climate readiness, housing affordability, vulnerable populations, 
lack of public spaces, COVID shown an extremely harsh light on all of these challenges and revealed in a completely uh, uncompromising way, all of our vulnerabilities. It turns out one of the things that we've learned is that mixed use walkable neighborhoods in fact have many of the characteristics that address these issues best and make them resilient in a pandemic. So this is actually the view out my window. I, as I'm speaking to you, I'm looking out the window and that's what I see. I live in uh, an area called Wellington Place, which is actually based on a wonderful plan from 1837, which was the Western expansion of the city of Toronto with two squares and a linear park along Wellington Street and has become uh, a very lived in area based on work with Barbara Hall and the Kings and Jane Jacobs, uh, whom we worked with um, in the 1990s. Um, now this is interesting. Public health has said that the same characteristics, this is Peel Region Public Health, Public Health by Design. This is uh, from page 18 of a document that they published that the very same considerations that were important in dealing with infec infectious diseases going back to 19th century and early 20th century epidemics, cholera, typhoid, typhus, tuberculosis, and so on, and 21st century epidemics. Now they, when this was produced, they had not yet experienced COVID, but they anticipated chronic, chronic diseases uh, such as we have related to um, the kind of uh, things that happened with the sedentary lifestyle and that the policy response both to epidemics or pandemics and to chronic diseases were exactly the same. Community design, healthy, compact, complete communities supporting increased walking, cycling, and public transit use. And this, this way of thinking about cities addresses the triple threat, chronic disease, infectious disease, but climate change. There, there's a wonderful convergence of being able to address all three of those things simultaneously. And it's interesting that the public health officials are now playing a very key role at the policy table when development is discussed. So this is a little diagram I created to uh, make this point of the, the both the infectious and the um, chronic that here we have when public health officials were very involved in the early 20th century and they were looking at people living in overcrowded not overly dense, but overcrowded. And that's a really important distinction that Jane Jacobs makes in Death and Life of Great American Cities. People were living in unhealthy conditions and subject to infectious disease, Lower East Side tenements in New York City. But the kind of ubiquitous, ubiquitous 21st century suburban anywhere that we've become so familiar with, with virtually every adult making every trip by automobile um, is, equally damaging to our health. So some key lessons for resiliency in a post-pandemic age coming out of COVID. One, density is not the enemy. Transit is not obsolete. Equity is resilient. And value engineering redundancy is very important for resilience. And much is to be learned from improvised pilots. So in the city of Toronto, really quickly, there had long been advocacy for increased opportunities to cycle safely in the city. So all of a sudden, what we were calling these safe ways emerged, uh, which were starting to build toward what had been completely lacking, which is a, a real network of the ability to cycle. And you can see, obviously, it's much easier to adapt the pre-war city than it is the post-war city, but efforts being made in both. So these pivoting really, really quickly from people's fear of being in the subway, a, a natural fear you see on the right, and wanting to get onto their bikes and walk and uh, avoid the uh, exposure coming from COVID, uh, the city very quickly 
uh, added 40 kilometers of expanded bike routes, that, bike routes which it had been doing painfully slowly. Um, Cafe TO remarkably allowed these cafes to take away uh, parking lanes all over the city, uh, create outdoor dining. Not only was this socially incredibly positive, and this is something that will not go away clearly, uh, it has happened even through the cold months with uh, windbreaks and some outdoor heating. But Torontonians were changed by this. And it was done uh, remarkably fast and it saved a lot of these businesses. And the very idea that waiters could walk across the sidewalk and serve somebody a drink, which had been impossible before, suddenly became possible. Really dramatically, that's the same park in the image that I showed you earlier uh, of my neighborhood. All of a sudden our parks became living rooms and all over our cities and trails and the waterfront and everywhere became places where people were gathering, uh, enjoying social life. Um, we were using these spaces as intensely as Italians use piazzas. These were really the locus of social life and you can see how people were adapting these spaces for those uses. What we learned is that um, resiliency was really enhanced by these informal social networks, spontaneous interactions around people who self-organized to look after each other, uh, to provide services to each other, and both from a standpoint of mental, mental and physical health played an invaluable role. Access to nature also, again, for mental and physical health. So this is something, again, the triple threat, uh, clearly from the standpoint of reducing CO2 emissions, having forested areas, having green space is incredibly important, but it protecting those areas, and I think of the green belt in particular, is revealed itself to be extremely important, more so than we perhaps had realized in the time of COVID. So the key issues remain and they're intersected. They can form vicious circles if they're not done well or virtuous circles if they're done well. And the key things that we have to do enabled by governance, leadership and resources are creating complete neighborhoods, embracing mix and diversity everywhere, that 15 minute neighborhood, changing how we move, getting out of our cars and being able to use all the other means to move around the cities, the revival and expansion of the commons, the spaces that we share, the parks, the open spaces, the squares, the trails, and essentially seeing cities not in opposition to nature, but as a key part of nature. And all these things come together in vital urban transformations ecosystem management related to climate change, connectedness, uh, intelligent uses of technology, social cohesion, and the knowledge economy. So one of the things for our region in particular, getting to that idea of complete neighborhoods is that our distinguishing characteristic is that we are the most diverse city region in the world. Over 50% of us were born elsewhere, which is astonishing, and over 50% identify as visible minorities. Those two facts, and by the way, what you're seeing here is when the subway was opened around Union Station, and you can see who was here versus one of my frequent uses of GO trains, I took this picture of people coming out of Union Station, and we are a completely different society um, in that couple of generations since the opening of the, uh, of the Young Subway Line. Uh, this, it's not only the fact that we have these two amazing statistics, but it's how we feel about it, how we are dealing with it. And this, I would maintain, this human diversity is our natural resources, our natural resource, which is far more valuable for Canada than all the oil and gas, which is in the ground in Alberta. Uh, that 
a, a conference like Collision, which um, you may or may not be aware of, uh, which is of people in the tech industry deciding to come to Toronto and not to Los Angeles or someplace else where they might have gone, they made it very clear that the reason they came here was that diversity of talent. For the most part, and this is by no means perfect, and there are exceptions, and we're dealing with challenges all the time, but the fact is we're dealing with them, and most people in our city region regard that diversity in an extremely positive light. And as you know, that is hardly the case in most parts of the world where diversity is seen as problematic. So the question is, can we really leverage this diversity and make it our greatest virtue and strength as we go forward? And a very significant key to that is housing affordability. And here we have a big problem. As we all know, housing in our city region has become severely unaffordable for many people. It's a major point of discussion now. We've just seen the provincial task force come out with recommendations, some of which are useful, uh, but in my view, really don't get to the heart of the problem. But this is clearly something which if we fail to deal with this, this will undermine our success as a city region. Um, David Holchansky, a professor at U of T, uh, did this really uh, significant analysis that he called the three cities, uh, tracking uh, census from 1970 to 2015. And what he was showing was the migration of poverty on the left, which used to be called inner city poverty, which interestingly enough ended up being outer city poverty on the right. And what it's doing when you expand outside the boundaries of the city of Toronto and which you see in the, in the center of the image on the right is this pattern of poverty by postal code actually being sported throughout the region. And it relates very much to housing affordability to mobility. So this is an enormous challenge undermining that greatest strength, which is our human diversity. This whole idea of complete communities of an aging population of where will seniors live? Are they isolated from the community? Are, part of the, are they part of the community? Where will children live and play? Uh, the Center for Disease Control um, in the US defines aging in place as the ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently and comfortably regardless of age, income and ability level. Um, who would have imagined how many children would be living in high rise buildings, living vertically. And the fact that we, in so many cases now, a sign goes up saying to people who live either renting or purchasing, there will be no schools for your kids because we haven't prepared for them. So we're now seeing that, and I, I guess there's a blockage on that wonderful quote up at the top. If I'm seeing that on my screen, I guess you are as well. I don't quite know how to get rid of that. But there's a quote from a colleague of mine, Jonathan Barnett, a uh, very well-known urban designer, who says, it's not how dense you make it, it's how you make it dense. And what we're seeing is that success goes to cities that build sustainable, inclusive neighborhoods, that mixing living and work, great streets, local shopping and services, transit for a mix of incomes and needs and have the density to support this. So this is the St. Lawrence neighborhood in Toronto housing some 10,000 people. Uh, this was a great new neighborhood was a, that was created after the central area plan uh, starting in the 1970s in Toronto. And it really demonstrated the viability of mixed income. The full span of, of incomes with nonprofit housing, co-op housing, market housing uh, in this neighborhood, schools, local shopping, parks, and so on, it's all there. To be avoided are two knee-jerk reactions to the need to provide housing. If you isolate housing as a land use category and you say, we're only gonna solve for this one variable and let's do it in a very expedient way. This is a very real temptation that we're seeing now and it's tall and sprawl. We are seeing that sprawl occurring at the edges of our region still at industrial strength. And we're seeing also 
hyperdensity in terms of the forest of towers that you see depicted here in buildings 40, 50, 60, 80, in some cases, stories tall, terrible microclimatic conditions, really making hostile environments and providing housing that is hardly suitable for the kind of complete communities that we desire. There's nothing wrong with some tall buildings, but this over-reliance on either of these two extreme forms is extremely damaging. This is an image you may have seen published uh, a week ago uh, from the latest census, and it's showing a really unhealthy form of bifurcation that's happening. So extreme density occurring in the urban core of Toronto, the dark color right at the bottom where you can see the outline of Toronto Island, extreme growth occurring in the darker blue, extending all the way up to Georgian Bay um, in these outlying areas, jumping over the green belt. And then the lighter blue areas that are relatively stagnant and in some cases are actually losing population. Mississauga, astonishingly, astonishingly is actually losing population. Brampton, where I've been advising for the last three years, just over that line at the same time is growing at an extraordinary rate. So addressing that light blue area is extremely critical. And one of the recommendations of the um, task force, the Ontario government task force on housing affordability to open up what's called the yellow belt is actually a very good one. There are a lot of things that are missing in terms of getting to real affordability, but that is an important one. So this is some work done by the City Building Institute at Ryerson, where I was a co-director for a time, looking at density done right, distributed density, addressing the missing middle, unlocking the yellow belt. And what you see on the right are all of those forms of housing, some of which will now be permitted as of right by the, if the task force recommendations are followed in all the single family neighborhoods throughout the province are really critical. That being able to do that form of housing in terms of serving the needs of the population, in many cases, allowing existing homeowners to have secondary suites, laneway housing, additional units on their properties, and uh, triplexes, duplexes, fourplexes, small walk-up buildings is extremely important, as well as mid-rise buildings. So this is a, a wonderful little example of urban acupuncture. This is a plan I worked on for Mississauga for the foot of Huron, Ontario, uh, where it hits uh, Lake Ontario. Um, and this little urban village, uh, which has a variety of housing uh, from those small apartment buildings, public space, live work units that you see on the lower right on Lakeshore Boulevard, public space, it has, it has all of those attributes. So these points of acupuncture are happening throughout the region and they are to be celebrated. But it's not just about the housing, the point I was making earlier. It's about social development. It's about all those other attributes of Anne Hidalgo's image of the 15 minute neighborhood. And this is a, a wonderful example from Regent Park in Toronto, another master plan that I worked on. This is the Daniel Spectrum for the Arts, um, a cultural center that houses many, many different organizations that serves not only this neighborhood, but people from all over the city. So wherever we do this intensification, we have to not just see the, do, see the housing or the offices, we have to all see, see the social, cultural, recreational infrastructure. This, and these are some images from Regent Park, which has arguably the best indoor swimming pool in the city, has the kinds of opportunities that you see here, employs young people from the community. This is really what makes this neighborhood and many others successful. The, the, Perhaps the biggest and most interesting design problem of the next couple of generations is the transformation of post-war suburbia. So this is Mississauga City Center, which starts off uh, a regional mall uh, created by developer S.P. McLaughlin, 
in mid 20th century, surrounded by thousands of surface parking spaces and farmers fields. Um, it now with the, with the LRT coming up here, Ontario from Port Credit and eventually to Brampton um, is now the locus of really intense development. But it's not just the towers, it's how you create all the other attributes of the humane environment. Um, Sheridan College, the library, um, the other public spaces, the uh, Living Center for the Arts, all of those other things are critical. Changing how we move, another one of those major decisions. This is a really important moment in our regional history. In 1971, then progressive conservative premier of the province, Bill Davis from Brampton, stands up in the Ontario legislature and I'm gonna read this quote because it's so important. We must make a decision as to whether we are trying to build a transportation system to serve the automobile or one which will best serve people. If we are building a transportation system to serve the automobile, the Spadina Expressway would be a good place to start. But if we are building a transportation system to serve people, the Spadina Expressway is a good place to stop very, very powerful, momentous moment where those two paradigms overlap and cross. We need to advance the unprecedented $62 billion investment in transit infrastructure in subway expansion, BRT, LRT, um, all of the other forms of transit which are happening throughout the region uh, and $145 billion in other infrastructure that are going on now. And we need to leverage that infrastructure to create those walkable neighborhoods. But here's the irony. At the very same time that our provincial government is making that $62 billion investment and promoting TOCs, transit-oriented communities, that little diagram that I showed you earlier, we have a proposal almost 50 years later to the day from Bill Davis standing up and making that statement in the Ontario legislature to bring back a truly flawed concept undermining this very investment. So Highway 413, environmental degradation of the Greenway, vast land requir requirements, uh, in negative impacts on agriculture, creating a barrier, inducing a form of development inevitably producing sprawl auto-oriented development, inducing congestion. We know that that happens every time you build one of these highways and inhibiting su sustainable growth. And the diagram on the right actually is produced by the city of Brampton fighting this highway and showing the negative impacts that it would have and proposing instead a solution, not eliminating the automobile, but not in the form of a 400 series limited access highway. We have to get back to something we actually did rather well for a time. This is looking up Young Street and the fact that every one of the subway stops on Young Street has produced not only in, not always in the most graceful form, but tens of thousands of people living and working at every subway stop and being able to walk to transit. So these were the, before the name, these were the TOCs. Part of weaning ourselves of the automobile is using a whole bunch of different technologies, clearly bike share, uh, sharing automobiles, um, using technology, advanced technology to eliminate uh, fare barriers, getting onto transit, all of these things in very sophisticated ways to make it extremely easy to use all forms of transit and active transportation. We have to make our streets safe for cyclists. So on the left is around the corner from where I live on Portland Street and cyclists in, and I'm often one of them, my wife and I on our tandem or me on my bicycle, negotiating the traffic. And every time you do that, you take your life in your hands. And how do we get to the safe cyclists? Um, the safe separated bike lanes throughout the city, accelerating that network. Oops. 
new designs of streets, which again, don't eliminate the automobile, complete streets. We talk about complete streets as well as complete neighborhoods. And there's a whole new generation of engineers coming out of the universities who don't call themselves traffic engineers anymore. They're transportation engineers and they reverse the pyramid. Pedestrians first, then transit, then cyclists, and then the car all in their place, sharing the rights of way. Another key ingredient of the transformation that we have to keep a focus on is the revival of the commons. How do we continue for that diverse population to make the city and the city region inclusive with shared common ground and opportunities for all? So the image on the left is from Kensington Market. It's an older image where all these new immigrant populations coming into the city were able to set up their businesses and where you had spaces, informal social spaces connected to those where people got to know each other. So where are those in that auto-oriented post-war world of the strip mall? And you can see the similar kinds of businesses more recently throughout the 905. And yet, what do you have outside the businesses? You have a surface parking lot. So how do we bring back the com that common space? How do we make those spaces workable and inviting for that diverse population that we have become in this extraordinarily heterogeneous society? And how do we deal with a new problem, which is cyberspace? As I mentioned, my whole career was dealing with technology, but technology, we used to think of actual machines. We thought of internal combustion engines as technology. Now, whenever we say technology, we mean digital technology. So this is from an article from the, the New Yorker about the fact that the automobile era was a terrible mistake, but how do we avoid making the same mistake with an uncritical embrace of digital technology? And this pair of images for me says it all. I took the image on the left in a Starbucks in Palo Alto. Starbucks are designed for people to be alone. Um, I didn't stage this. Every single person in that Starbucks, and all of you know that that's often the case, is either on a phone, an iPad, or a laptop. No one is talking to anyone else. No one is actually in the space. They might as well not even be there. On the right is one of uh, our favorite cafes, my wife and I. It's called Forno Cultura. It's just around the corner on King Street. And the owner, who's an architectural graduate from the University of Toronto and, and has become a good friend, devised something really clever. The, the little tables that you see in the middle, you can, probably can't see that. The tables are 30 centimeters or one foot wide. So when you sit there and have your coffee, you are within, you're either facing or beside somebody within conversational distance. And without being forced to, without this being um, artificial, almost invariably you strike up conversations with other people. Now there's technology there. You can see screens. This is not uh, a Luddite operation, but it's technology in its place, not putting technology ahead of human interaction. So how do we make new neighborhoods that have those spaces for multi-generations and have that common space and have all the attributes of walkability dealing with the triple threat that I mentioned before, including climate change. So this is from a plan that's going ahead in Brampton by the Daniels Corporation. And what's really interesting is the variety of housing types, housing different people with different needs, different household configurations, surrounding very importantly, a shared common space. So picking up lessons, I would suggest, from what we've been doing in COVID. So in the same space, you have things designed for teens, for youth, for seniors, the exercise equipment that you see there, all walkable, all within the heart of the neighborhood, all tied together by a series of generous sidewalks, trails, and pedestrian spaces. 
these are a few examples from things that I've been involved in over the years that I wrote about in Toronto Reborn. Uh, this is Queen's Key in Toronto. When I was a student in architecture, I worked on the top image in Terminal Warehouse, which was a million square foot warehouse. There were not streetcars, but there were actual trains running down the middle of Queen's Key. And those upturned sewer pipes that you see there were from something called Harborfront Passage. When the federal government purchased these lands to create Harborfront, that was the first attempt to allow pedestrians to be safely in the area. Fast forward to the image on the bottom uh, through an international competition, the complete transformation of Queen's Key into this great greenway, this great common space on the waterfront. This is the King Street pilot. This is a remarkable made in Toronto solution where because of the success of getting people to live in downtown Toronto, the, Queens, the King Street cars were immobilized. They couldn't move, as you see in the upper images, stymied by traffic. So a simple regulation, which just said, you can drive one block and then you have to turn right. That's it. By doing that, the streetcars move at a very significant pace and all this extra space was freed up in the curve lane to expand social space, to expand the commons. The Bentway, which some of you may know about, I would encourage you to visit. Uh, this is one of the greatest projects I've ever had the opportunity to be involved in, is the transformation of this no man's land under the Gardner Expressway into an extraordinary public space for all uses, for all seasons. And this is the original first phase. This is now expanding along seven kilometers all the way from the exhibition over to the Don River in collaboration with the City of Toronto, uh, with the BIAs, with Waterfront uh, Toronto, uh, with a whole series of private developers to create this great network of expanded common ground. Now, seeing cities as part of nature. This is a diagram that David Crombie popularized when uh, he was doing the Waterfront Regen Regeneration Trust many years ago, pointing out that the waterfront of Toronto is not a narrow strip on Lake Ontario. It actually is all these watersheds extending up into the recharge area in the Oak Ridges Moraine. And so in a sense, all sites in our city region are to a greater or lesser degree waterfront sites, which is a really, really powerful thing. We, and you know, I go back to uh, the indigenous teachings we heard about at the opening of the session, very eloquently expressed this new realization that we are not fighting nature, we are part of nature. Um, climate change and climate readiness, this is flooding at the, at the, in the Lower Don, is something we can no longer close our eyes to. This is happening daily, it's happening across our country and around the world. And we are, we are learning how to tap into the incredible healing power of nature. This is the Leslie Street Spit, uh, Tommy Thompson Park, extending five kilometers out into Lake Ontario. Um, it was originally intended to create a, uh, a barrier to enable a large port, which never materialized because uh, the container ships could no longer make their way up the St. Lawrence Seaway and became this extraordinary asset where nature simply took over. And so being able to be in this space right in the heart of the city uh, for so many reasons addresses our needs. This is um, the Lower Don. This is a competition that I was involved in on a winning team with my colleague, Michael Van Valkenburg, a wonderful landscape architect for the Lower Don dealing with the issue of flood proofing a competition run by Waterfront Toronto and the idea was instead of just creating higher dikes or a mechanical flood proofing solution to work with nature to create a new river estuary, parkland, new neighborhoods, all as part of an integrated solution. So the problem set that was posed for the international competition was to take the area that you see there to renaturalize the mouth of the river, to create a continuous waterfront park system, 
to provide for new development in that setting to prioritize public, prioritize public transit and trail systems, develop a gateway into the portlands to humanize existing infrastructure, um, enable opportunities for interaction for the water and sustainable development, all of that. And that required an extremely interdisciplinary team. And what it did is it moved from what was going to happen through a series of environmental assessments, which you see on the right, which is solving each problem in isolation in a silo to the integrated solution that you see on the right and extending this thinking all the way up the watershed and out to the spit and along to the beaches and what's called Lake Ontario Park, a, a different way of thinking about the city in nature. This is, these are some diagrams we did during the course of the composition of the competition, showing different habitats along the river, perched wetlands, and then extending that right into the building fabric of the neighborhood. So it all becomes of a piece. And this you see on the right, an image of what's being created and a $1.2 billion construction project funded by three levels of government is literally underway as we speak to deliver this transformation. What we've learned is that sustainability is not a category, but it's a way of synthesizing and connecting everything we do a DNA of overlap and integration. The diagram on the left, I borrowed from Hammarby Soyestad in Stockholm, showing how every one of those things, some technical and some simply the way we have access to aspects of our daily life. This is the equivalent of the 15 minute neighborhood through a sustainability lens and that every phase of every development should contain that essential DNA of a mix of uses of public spaces, of access to transit, uh, dealing with heritage, with embodied energy, every time we make a move to doing development. That as we do this, it can't be insider baseball. We have to engage the public, school children, the public neighbors in the transformation. And this is a wonderful image from what started off life as a marketing center for this new neighborhood in Stockholm called Hammarby Soyestad and has ended up being a community resource, a glass house it's called, that has remained where people who live in that community are involved in the transformation of their neighborhood and the way in which it has become sustainable, uses energy, deals with waste and so on. And people are extremely proud of that. So this retooling for change that I was talking about has to be dynamic. It has to deal with all of these themes that I've mentioned, and it has to work from the scale of the city region. And I'm just gonna work from the upper left going clockwise. It has to work from the city region, the, my first image in the presentation, to the city, that's the city of Toronto, to the neighborhood, which you see on the top right, down to a component of the neighborhood, lower left, down to the street, and ultimately down to a building. And all of these themes play out at every scale. They nest inside each other, they support each other. You can't operate at only one scale, you have to operate simultaneously on all of these scales. So back to the city region, if we continue to seriously apply three provincial policies, the growth plan, the urban growth centers, those TOCs, and that only some of them are represented here by the red circles. If we succeed in hanging on to the green belt and avoiding disruptions and interventions, and if we continue to make the investment in transit, what we will end up with is a form of regional city, which is based not on a single center as in that 1966 image or the 1940 image that I showed you, but a polynucleated, that means many centers, all of whom are viable, all of whom are mixed, all of whom are walkable and have all of those attributes of urban living, the 15 minute neighborhoods, and all of whom are 
inherently more sustainable throughout the region. So this is the, the second paradigm I described actually taking over. So I'm gonna show you from the work I've been doing in Brampton for the last three years, how this actually plays out within the city. I'm going from the region to the city now. So Brampton in 2018 adopted a 2040 vision for the future. Uh, this was an exercise led by my colleague uh, and friend, Larry Beasley, former chief planner of Vancouver involving 50,000 people. And Brampton committed itself uh, in 2018 to making a major shift away from auto dependence to a more sustainable future and continues to focus on that. So in the foreground in this image, you see a key part of this, which is at what's called Uptown in Brampton, uh, the intersection of Steele's Main Street and here Ontario, and what is currently the Gateway Bus Terminal. And this is a place which is the beginning or an image of what that mixed use, pedestrian friendly, vital mixed use neighborhood would be. Well, this is actually happening. Rio Can, which owned a regional mall in this location called Shoppers World, is actually working on demolishing that mall and replacing it with a neighborhood. And I, with my colleagues in Brampton, the urban designers, the planners, the transportation people, uh, the parks department, the school boards, the community facilities people, all the various actors on the public side with Metrolinks, with Infrastructure Ontario, are working on a transformation of this area. There are now, in addition to RioCan, there are 12 more developers who have joined in this transformation. Over 20 million square feet of mixed use development is being created, forming that neighborhood or set of interlocking neighborhoods at this location anchored by an urban main street taking the retail out of the mall with a great mix of housing both uh, market housing condominiums rental housing and will include um, inclusionary housing as well and indoor and outdoor spaces in the middle of all this and there's patrick brown the mayor of brampton making a statement about the, what's happening at Uptown. The heart of this is a community hub. And this community hub, this is a prototype, which is actually now going into realization. It will be a pavilion in a central park in this neighborhood. It will contain school, library, community center, healthcare, post-secondary education with Sheridan College, uh, an entrepreneur center, arts and culture facilities, and a whole host of interrelated things that people in this walkable community will have access to providing its common ground. A breakthrough in the way we think about planning for this neighborhood is a dynamic planning tool that we call the living plan, which is the counterpoint to all the regulatory statutory plans, the official plan, the provincial plan, zoning bylaws, plans of subdivision, uh, the Ontario Building Code, there is alongside of that and running ahead of it, the living plan, which actually looks at the glue using a two-dimensional and three-dimensional computer model and where everybody can see what everybody else is doing. All the developers, all the public sector actors looking at active green floors, ground floors, looking at the hub design, looking at the expansion of the public realm, the green spaces. And you can see on the right, all of the cohorts who are actually working with us and the staff in Brampton, who are all seeing their work and working together in different groups on this living plan. So this is a three-dimensional image, which is a kind of vision a key move is connecting Creek to Creek from the Etobicoke Creek to Fletcher's Creek through the neighborhood, embracing not only the white, which represents new build, but the existing single family neighborhoods around and connecting them because they fall within walking distance of the main street of the community hub and the new transit infrastructure, which is emerging here on here Ontario Main Street and ultimately on Steels as well. Now, these are a series of diagrams using the living plan, applying the zoom. 
So on the upper left is roughly nine square kilometers showing how the pieces of this emerging new world and the big moves, the creek to creek, the green spaces play out. Uh, upper right, zooming in again with a focus on the community hub, which you see in blue and more detail on the neighborhood. Lower left, the, the same nine square kilometers with, with active transportation and transit. There are six transit stops all within that um, very tight area around Uptown and then the community hub as the beating heart of this community. And then zooming in again, this is something that normally is not done. We deal with these very dry statutory required plans, but this is an attempt working with the staff in Brampton with the urban design staff uh, to actually show the life in this place. This is an, an X-ray looking at the life in the ground floors and working very closely with RioCan, the redeveloper of the mall and with their neighboring developers. And we sit down with these plans and we go over how each piece of the development, each chess piece as it comes along, fits into this larger picture. You see on the right, uh, nighttime use and winter use. So this is looking at all seasons, all times of day. So getting to a conclusion, the kind of transformation that I'm describing, the primacy of the second paradigm propelled by COVID and now dealing with the imperative of climate change is a multi-general undertaking. It transcends any single political administration. It requires deep and wide community steward stewardship and consistency. So these are a couple of images uh, from Waterfront Toronto. Waterfront Toronto has been going for 20 years. And in the course of time, all the political leadership at all three levels of government has changed. Many, many things have changed. And yet there's a kind of consistency in the way that this transformation is being guided and stewarded with strong community engagement at every step of the way. This unprecedented collaboration that I've mentioned that I was showing you in the living plan has to take place at every level. You cannot do this in disciplinary silos or political silos. So this is when I was working on the competition for the Lower Don with the team and around the table, we had planners, architects, landscape architects, engineers, ecologists, economists, social providers, artists, working together in a complex team where good ideas can, could emerge and did emerge from every member of the team uh, favoring lateral thinking and synthetic solutions. This is, um, and this quote is obscured. I hope I can, yeah, this is a wonderful quote from Jane Jacobs. Cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. So this is from the work in Uptown. On the lower left, you see a site visit we did to um, Canoe Landing Park and the two schools and community center in the heart of City Place. And that's all the staff from Brampton, from all the different departments who are working together on this Uptown core. And then you see all the logos just gives you, this is not a complete list, but these are, this is that village the everybody that Jane Jacobs was talking about who are involved in this transformation of Uptown. So it's a bunch of developers, it's UN Habitat, it's different levels of government, it's Peel Region, it's the Board of Education, it's the Lur Urban Land Institute, um, Sheridan College, the Urban Economy Forum, Evergreen, everybody has played a vital role here. And finally, uh, the need to keep communicating to the public, to get out there in the street, in the neighborhoods, to talk about this, not just do it from inside an ivory tower. I keep stressing, this is not insider baseball. It has to involve everybody from school children to people of every age group in communities. And finally, to be absolutely clear the choice between these paradigms, and I mentioned that unfortunately, 
the old paradigm is still operating is this is not about a lifestyle choice. What is really at stake here is our future as a species on this planet. Cities are now the dominant place of living and will soon be housing 50% of the world's population and cities and city region, regions are the crucibles and the only place where solutions can be found to problems that are otherwise intractable, most notably climate change. And I will stop there. Mm -hmm.